I'm Dwayne Brown tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. A San Diego lawmaker becomes the latest state senator to face criminal charges. Also tonight, a teenager's joke on Twitter created quite a scare for South Bay High School. Inside, cooking the bodies. And we visit a sinister site in Tijuana where investigators are searching for victims of drug violence. It's unfair to California utility ratepayers. What that statement by the state's Public Utility Commission means for San Onofre nuclear power plant owners and proposed settlement revisions that could lead to consumer refunds. I'm Peggy Pico. Also ahead, swapping avocados and lemons for wine grapes. How San Diego's drought is changing local crops. And the governor returns to the state capitol. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. San Diego lawmaker Ben Hueso has formally been charged with two counts of driving under the influence. The Democratic state senator was arrested just over two weeks ago after police spotted him driving the wrong way on a one-way street. Hueso said he would accept the consequences of his actions. He is the fourth Senate Democrat to face legal trouble this year. Chula Vista's Eastlake High School heightened its security today because of a Twitter threat. KPBS education reporter Matt Bowler says the Internet threat was determined to be a bad joke, but only after uh, quite a scare. Matt joins us from the newsroom. First, Matt, tell us exactly what happened. Well, over the weekend, a 14-year-old freshman boy at Eastlake High posted on Twitter that he was going to, quote, shoot up a school, end quote. And then it was along with a picture of him holding a gun. Another student saw the tweet and told the school. And how did the uh, school react to this? Well, the principal sent out a notice to parents saying the school is working closely with Chula Vista Police investigating the matter. School was not canceled, but some extra security was on campus. When police did find the boy who wrote the threatening tweet, they learned that the parents knew about him making the threat, but didn't take it seriously. It seemed like the parents were aware of what was going on. The parents seemed to think that it was something that had been done previously, but didn't really have any sort of you know, true threat to it and intention from the student's part. The student, my understanding from police is that the student was apologetic, the student felt bad. And Matt, it seems like uh, parents and students are still learning. Uh, once something is on the internet, it never really goes away. Yeah, that's right. And it's, it's one of the district's biggest challenges is teaching students and parents that once something's online, it can have a lifelong impact. Online presence is there forever, regardless of whether or not you can post something, say, oh, I shouldn't have posted that and take it down immediately. Someone grabbed it. Someone grabbed a screenshot of it. Someone's going to find it. It's going to be out there forever. So we want to teach students that that's there, and these things can have potential consequences down the road. So what happens to the uh, boy now? Well, the, the district is working with Chula Vista Police on the investigation, who will determine if any criminal charges need to be filed. And the boy stayed home from school today. And the district is considering possible disciplinary actions like suspension or expulsion. KPBS education reporter Matt Bowler. Prosecutors are joining with defense attorneys in the Colorado theater shooting case to oppose television coverage in the courtroom during the trial. Now, San Diego native James Holmes is accused of killing a dozen people in a movie theater more than two years ago. His lawyers say courtroom cameras would violate his right to a fair trial. Prosecutors say... TV coverage would put intense and hurtful coverage on victims who testify. The trial is scheduled to begin in December. There's a state of emergency for some parts of Arizona this evening where thunderstorms drop record amounts of rainfall. One woman was killed when her car was swept away. Maricopa and La Paz counties are the hardest hit. Nearly three inches of rain fell in Phoenix before 7 this morning. Dozens of drivers got stranded by the sudden flood. This, a big tidal wave just came up and just totally took me out and it flooded my truck and came up over my hood of my truck, the top of my truck, and it just took my truck out, moved my truck sideways, and then it killed it. It wouldn't start. And then after that, it just started floating. And I'm sitting in the cab and it got up to about my waist. I was sitting literally waist deep, waist deep in water. 
Yeah, all this rain came from the remnants of Hurricane Norbert, which also uh, caused some flooding here in San Diego County before moving east. While every little bit helps, water managers are still hoping for an El Nino to bring rain to California this winter. The chance of an El Nino has dropped from 80 to about 60 percent. Forecasters say if we get one, it will be a weak event at best. If the sea surface temperatures aren't as warm, then that means if an El Nino does develop, it's more likely going to be a weak El Nino. And with a weak El Nino, you don't get as strong of a correlation of higher precipitation for the winter. Forecasters say it will take several winters with above normal rainfall to make up for three years of prolonged drought. San Diego attorney and consumer advocate Mike Aguirre is asking state utility regulators to set aside any deal to share the cost of shutting down the San Onofre nuclear plant in the North County. In a filing with the uh, State Public Utilities Commission last week, Aguirre argued Southern California Edison was operating without a valid permit. He says the utility should have applied for a new license when it replaced the steam generators. Our argument is that Southern Cal Edison, it has now been firmly established, knowingly evaded the requirement of having a safety license in place. When they put in the new uh, steam generators that failed two years into the 40 years they were supposed to last, they used a different company than the original company. They had different designs, they had more tubes, they had less protection, uh, and they were warned ahead of time that the very thing that, was, that did happen was going to happen, and they ignored all of that. Aguirre renewed his call to investigate who's responsible for the uh, shutdown. He says any settlement should be silenced until culpability is determined. Peggy Pico is taking a closer look at the proposed changes. Joining me is Don Kelly with UCAN, the Utility Consumers Action Network, a ratepayer consumer advocate group who is not involved but is closely monitoring the settlement plan, and attorney Mike Aguirre, who is a vocal critic of the original settlement proposal and the revised proposal. Welcome to Evening Edition. Good evening. Now, Don, the original settlement agreement announced last March has to be approved by the state's Public Utilities Committee, uh, or, uh, Commission, CPUC. Um, they said that the settlement was not fair to the ratepayers last Friday. What kind of revisions are they asking for? They, what they ask for is that uh, should there be uh, third-party recovery, that um, the ratepayers are entitled to a bigger percentage of the recovery. So, for example, there's currently an arbitration going on between Mitsubishi and Southern California Edison regarding the replacement steam generators that were installed in San Onofre, which later um, did not work and caused the plant to shut down. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission says that they want a 50-50 split of any recovery towards the ratepayers um, for um, arbitration money that is either judged or uh, through a settlement. They also want additional recovery for any insurance money that the utility gets for replacement power. Instead of going from, they want 95 percent of the money to be going towards the ratepayer. They also authorize that should there be any recovery for refinancing of the remaining assets, uh, that the ratepayers get the benefit of that refinancing. And they also say that uh, from a legal perspective that they are, would would be willing to recommend the commission approve the settlement as is with these changes. With those four kind of major with, changes. With those changes that should there be third party recovery that um, the remaining part of the settlement uh, with regards to how much the ratepayers get, how much the, uh, what, what goes into rate base, what stays, what goes out of rate base, all of those chain, all of those parts of the settlement will remain. Okay, in Mike, now off the top, this sounds like, wow, consumers are going to get some money back, but you say this isn't the case. What is your opinion of these revisions, proposed well, revisions? Well, the consumers aren't going to get any money back yet. They're being charged $5 billion for the mistake that San Onofre's uh, people made. And the, the fact that San Onofre sued someone else, that's between San Onofre and Mitsubishi. The ratepayers shouldn't be paying for that and then possibly get money back. They shouldn't be charged for that at all. And you're saying we're paying for it because right now, and for several years now, we have been paying for whatever happens at San Onofre. Right. Uh, the uh, Southern Cal Edison never had permission to put the rates permanently, or put the cost of San Onofre into the rates permanently. They just skipped that step, and the Public Utilities Commission has allowed them to do that. And Don, do you think these revisions are fair? Do you think they go far enough? I actually supported the settlement uh, as it came out last March. 
I believe that given the amount of litigation that's been going on and the fact that the ratepayers are still paying for San Onofre and the fact that Edison is still fighting tooth and nail for its position and they want um, more money for themselves and less money for the ratepayers, that the settlement was, in fact, uh, worthy of approval by the commission. I'm actually happy that the Public Utilities Commission is, in fact, giving or requesting changes that also add to the benefits that the ratepayers would receive should extra money become, become available through either the settlement or litigation process and, uh, and with regards to arbitration in Mitsubishi, uh, recovery from insurance companies. Well, I do want to let folks know that Southern California Edison and SDG&E were invited to join us, but they declined to be in this interview saying they are evaluating uh, the ruling. So coming off of that, Don, first to you, have consumers actually been paying for replacement costs as Mike uh, has suggested? Yes, and part of the settlement means that they're going to be getting a refund or they're not they're going to be getting a refund of the money that is currently being collected and has been collected by offsetting other costs that they would be required to pay. And Mike, let me have you explain that because you're shaking your head. No, uh, consumers there, aren't going to get a refund. There are no refunds. They call it a refund mechanism. They claim that they're not going to charge ratepayers for other costs. There's been no review of that. There's been no analysis. There's been, there's, it's not a question of litigation. It's that there's been no investigation on who, who caused the problem how it came to be, and in fact, Southern Cal Edison was operating the steam generators without the replacement or without the license amendment that was required. And when you drive a car without a license and you cause an accident, you have to pay because it's per se unreasonable, and that's what happened here. It's per so, se unreasonable. In a sentence, do you think the revisions will be approved? I think that we'll go further than the revisions. I think we're going to have to redo it, and there's going to have to be an actual investigation of who caused the problem. And on the same question, do you think they'll be approved? I think the settlement will be approved with the current uh, or proposed revisions. All right, you can. Don Kelly and attorney uh, Mike Aguirre, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. San Diego Gas and Electric is looking to buy power produced locally to replace energy loss from the San Onofre plant. At least 200 megawatts would need, it, uh, would need to uh, come from renewable sources. The utility will accept bids until January 5th. SDG&E expects to get 33 percent of its juice from renewable sources this year, way ahead of the state-mandated target. Former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger returned to the state capitol today. He appeared at a climate change symposium with the current governor, Jerry Brown, who praised Schwarzenegger for signing California's landmark greenhouse gas law. Schwarzenegger also unveiled his official gubernatorial portrait, a giant image that looks like a photograph but actually is a painting by an Austrian artist who once painted John F. Kennedy. But not in my wildest dreams did I ever think that one day I will be governor or that one day there will be a portrait hanging here in the state capitol. I might have envisioned a sculpture on Muscle Beach. Yeah, the uh, painting will join the other gubernatorial portraits on the third floor of the capitol building. More than 22,000 people have gone missing in Mexico since the country declared war on drug traffickers in 2006. Some family members had hoped to find answers at a gruesome disposal site discovered in Tijuana several years ago. But from terrorist reporter Jill Replogo says that hope has dwindled. She and video journalist Katie Shulove visited the site. We want to warn you, some of the content of this report is disturbing. The ruins of rooster pens here suggest that, like many neighboring ranches, it was once used to raise birds for cockfighting. <laughs> it's a popular, if bloody, sport here in Tijuana. This is uh, Santiago Mesa's place. But several years ago, investigators uncovered a vastly more sinister use for this plot of land. Inside, cooking the bodies. We have a, just a little plastic tube and go this side. Dozens of bodies, victims of the drug war, were dissolved in lye here and the remains pumped into two septic tanks. You use uh, gravity or something like that. Fernando Osegueda heads the group of Baja California residents that led investigators to this site. Come down and go straight. And lately he's worked to turn it into a memorial to the victims. 
His group is made up of mothers, fathers, sisters, and uncles of people who have been kidnapped or gone missing. Osegueda says they've documented around 350 missing persons since 2006. The family's dogged quest for answers has led them to the scenes of some of Tijuana's darkest crimes. The search for this place started with a confession from a man named Santiago Mesa. He was captured in 2009, and when investigators asked Mesa to state his occupation, he said, Pozolero, or stewmaker. He dissolved bodies for a series of Tijuana drug barons. Mesa said he dissolved around 300 bodies at several locations in Tijuana, including 60 at the former Rooster Ranch. Authorities excavated the site in December of 2012. They found dozens of teeth, pieces of bone, and surgical hardware like knee screws. Investigators took all the evidence to Mexico City to analyze it and to look for DNA in the hopes of identifying some of the victims. Forensic scientists have pieced together evidence of at least 22 bodies at the site through recovered teeth. But Mexico's federal human rights prosecutor, Eliana Garcia, says they haven't recovered any useful DNA. We don't yet have a scientific advance that would allow us to confidently identify any of the remains that have been recovered. People could accuse us of not doing anything, but we don't want to give false hope that reopens wounds for the families. Lye, also known as caustic soda, destroys most of the bone and human tissue from which DNA could be extracted. But forensic experts in San Diego have been able to extract DNA from these kinds of remains. That was my role. Madeline Hinkis teaches anthropology at Mesa College, and she's the forensic anthropologist for the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office. She testified in a murder case against the leaders of a San Diego gang called Los Palillos. The gang disposed of several victims in lie in 2007. Two Mexican cartel leaders convicted of murder, kidnapping, and torture. Pretty much any tissue in the body has the DNA. Oh, the places that preserve best are in the bones, the, the thick cortex of the bones, which in this case wasn't present. But a lot of time it is done through tooth roots, because even if a body's been burned, those roots are protected in the bone, and the DNA is still in there. And it, it doesn't take very much DNA. Hinkis says when she and other forensic experts started on the Palillos case, they weren't sure whether they could get DNA from remains that had been so transformed. We haven't seen anything in the literature about it, and oftentimes when the the chemistry of the bone is this altered, the DNA just isn't any good. But through painstaking efforts, the DNA expert working on the case did eventually find a usable sample from a clump of tissue, and she positively identified one of the victims. The technology is there, but it takes time. There's probably a cost involved. Nobody wants to listen to us. Nobody. In Tijuana, Fernando Oseguera says he's frustrated with the lack of results from the government's investigation, but he's learned to be patient. His son, a 23-year-old engineering student, was kidnapped in 2007. Oseguera is still looking for him. This here is just part of what Santiago Mesa did. And he didn't dispose of all the bodies. Many were buried in different parts of the city. He and other family members of the missing keep searching for answers. They get anonymous tips through Facebook and email about where to look for evidence. They form search parties, knock on doors, talk to neighbors. For us, it's urgent. We want to know what happened with our loved ones. So we have to take the initiative. The Mexican government says it hasn't been able to identify victims at any of the locations used by Santiago. Mesa. At this site, just a few miles down the road from the former Rooster Ranch, the waxy remains of dissolved bodies are still present, exposed, ignored, anonymous. This is a body. You want to know the truth about what happened? We're seeking out the truth here, and the government is obligated to give it to us. In eight years of work, with hundreds of missing persons cases, Osegueda's group has only been able to return the remains of eight people to their families. How many bodies stay here? Jill Replogal, KBBS News. Look at this.
I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. How oil and gas fracking is fueling political divisions in Colorado. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. Our, mar our mountain and desert areas are expecting more rain this week, but not enough to help local farmers. Peggy Pico explains how growers are swapping water thirsty avocados for dry weather wine grapes. Years of drought and skyrocketing water prices has cost the county an estimated 10,000 acres of avocado tree losses over the last decade. Here to talk about local farmers adapting to low water crops and irrigation methods are my guests, Eric Larson with the San Diego Farm Bureau and Alicia Staley of Vesper Vineyards in Escondido. Welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Now, Eric, what kind of adjustments are San Diego uh, farmers, at least in our region, making to cope with this extended drought? Well, first, the cattle ranchers. I'll talk about them. They're in the back country. There hasn't been the grass that we normally get from the winter rains to grow, so they just have to have fewer mouths to feed. So they've had to sell off cattle prematurely and get rid of some of their breeding stock, which is unfortunate. The other growers who have crops in the ground are having to produce more per acre with the water they have and find out new growing techniques and be more efficient or unfortunately some are just making the decision to turn the water off on their farms. Now Alicia, you and your family uh, used to grow avocados and now you're growing uh, grapes for, for wine. Yes. Um, what prompted your family to switch uh, crops and, and how difficult was that switch? Um, well with the increased water cost, um, the grove was getting older and some parts of it needed to be replaced. So we still grow avocados, um, but we've, we've transitioned part of the grove is now five acres of vineyards. Um, and the avocados that are still around, we're replanting to a higher density, like Eric said, to increase the, the value per acre there. Now, Eric, some local growers say that they simply can't afford to water trees, whether it be avocado trees or citrus trees. How, many, how much, if you can give us an idea, are local farmers paying for water right now, and how does that compare to what they used to pay? Yeah, we've seen a, at least a doubling of the price of water in the last 10 years. So growers are now paying, the number won't mean much to the viewers, but it's thirteen to $1,400 an, an acre foot for water. Essentially the same price homeowners are paying for their water. Compared to farmers in the rest of the state, it's, it's three, four, five times as much as other farmers, their competitors are paying. So that's, what, that's what's really causing the trouble. And you say it's comparable to what uh, residents are paying. However, most residents' uh, households do not cover the acreage, correct? So we're talking a, a significant amount of money. Right, the same per gallon. Right. But they're using significant amounts more, yes. Do you have an idea at the Farm Bureau how many growers are actually leaving the uh, area because they can't either afford the water uh, or keep their farms? Yeah, well, I can't say they're leaving the area. What they're doing, they're now looking at orange trees or avocado trees they're no longer watering because most farmers live right on their farm. That's their home and they, they stay there. So, But th the number you said before is a number we think is accurate, about the 10,000 acres of avocados we've lost as the price of water went up and an untold number of citrus, because the citrus started to dis disappear before and we weren't keeping good track of that acreage, but it's reduced as well. Now, Alicia, you're a family, you're a family farmer, <laughs> your family's been in farming. What are other uh, local growers saying about trying to switch? Are other people joining in this effort? Maybe they might switch over to join uh, planting grapes. Yeah, it's interesting. There's, there's a few growers that are transitioning from you know citrus or avocados to grapes, um, but most of the new vineyards that have been planted are new to people who are entirely new to farming. Um, it's just now in the last about almost six months that I've had a handful of former flower growers or avocado growers say, I think I need to look at grapes. You know, what, 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 are, you guys, what are you guys doing? Because for, for grapes, we use one-tenth of the water that citrus does. We still use, we use more labor, but less water. Is it, if you had to say for farmers who, maybe people who haven't even farmed before, is it harder to grow grapes or avocados? It's different. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's a very different mindset. And uh, Eric, I knew that the uh, county is number one in the nation for avocado production, or at mm -hmm. least it used to be, and I believe it's uh, number five for lemon production. I don't know if that still holds. Do you think if the drought ended today, if we just had this uh, El Nino that's been promised, that farmers here would be able to recoup uh, their water losses and be able to continue growing crops as they used to? The reality is the price of water will continue to go up. And we do things like desalination, uh, recycling water, uh, buying water from other places. It's very, very expensive. So it'll still be expensive. So even if we overcome the drought, we still have to deal with the high price of water. So the farmers are gonna have to become much more efficient and produce more per acre or they will go away. And Alicia, we'll have to end on this. Do you think San Diego could uh, potentially become the next Napa? 
Not the next Napa, but we could be San Diego's own wine region with many different lots of small wineries all over the place. So watch out, Temecula. Different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Completely different. <laughs> completely all different. right. Alicia Staley and Eric Larson, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thunderstorms are still in the forecast for parts of the county. There's also a beach hazard uh, statement for the coast tonight. Temperatures at the beaches will be in the upper 70s day, daytime. Uh, inland temperatures in the mid-80s uh, tomorrow through Thursday. As for the mountains, upper 70s to low 80s. And in the desert, temperatures will be down into the 90s. Let's recap a couple of our top stories. San Diego lawmaker Ben Hueso has formally been charged with two counts of driving under the influence. The Democratic state senator was arrested just over two weeks ago after police spotted him driving the wrong way on a one-way street. Hueso said he would accept the consequences of his actions. And a scare at Eastlake High School in the South Bay today because of a student's joke on Twitter. A ninth grader tweeted he was going to shoot up a school. School officials took it seriously and sent a warning to parents. They haven't decided yet on disciplinary action. Tonight's stories are online at kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.